Hey everybody, welcome to another week of Age of Quarantine. Uh, I'm David Castillo. I'll be your host tonight. I am the head talent buyer and part owner of St. Vitus. Thank you for amazing guest today, Jacob Bannon from Converge, uh, Umbra Vite, and uh, many of your other favorite bands. So, without further ado, Jake is right on it. Connecting. Cheers. Jacob, hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Where are we at, Jake? We're in the car right now? I'm, I'm looking We're sitting in the car today. It's the, uh, it's the most quiet place uh, when I am currently at home. So Nice. Yeah. I We've seen people all over the place, so that's that's a that's a good thing, you know. Where, wherever you can find your little piece of quiet, where or take it. And uh, thank you for joining us. Really, yeah, no really appreciate it, man. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna have a chat, go through a bunch of stuff, and uh, I've been starting off all my interviews for Age of Quarantine in the same way, which is basically, if you aren't at home, do you know where you'd be today if you aren't quarantined? Let's see. If if I wasn't quarantined right now, I, I still believe I'd probably be at home at this point in the day. Uh, you know, I typically I try to to keep fairly regular hours when I'm at home, not touring um, between Death Wish. So I try to get home in a reasonable hour. Um, so yeah, I'd probably be here at this. Point. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I'd be you know if we were touring or had shows. I'd, probably getting doors would probably be opening to a show right now right sure yeah for real um, i mean that's yeah, that's about about it um so yeah basically you know i just like to locate everyone where they're at where is home for you jake is it still in massachusetts yeah i'm still in massachusetts i'm on the, on the north shore of mass um pretty much three quarters of converge is uh is rooted here and uh yeah i think it's the place in the world Great. Love it. Um, so I want to just kind of start off way back, just talking about earliest experiences with, with music and stuff like that. When you were uh, youngest, when was, when was like a, a really early memory of you just being like, yeah, music is, I'm starting to gravitate towards music. Oh, probably some sort of adolescent. You know, my, my brother was a, was a, like a eighties metal kid. Uh, you know, in the golden era, this is, we're talking about like, you know, 82 to 86 kind of time. And, you know, I just kind of looked up to him and followed what he was listening to. And so a lot of music got passed down to me uh, from him and his friends, things like that. Um, those are my earliest memories, you know, stuff like that, like the, the early classic heavy metal stuff. And uh, even like, basically, you know, like Queen the Game, which always kind of went on David Bowie, things like that. Sure. So um, when, you know, I think everyone obviously has these different moments where they start finding out, you know, more about extreme music or, or whatever it may be that brought you and all of us here today. What is, uh, what was kind of your earliest kind of experiences with, with hardcore and more like the underground music scene? When did you start being able to be in touch with that? Sure. Well, that, that came from BMX culture and supporting and whatnot. Um, and I remember being a kid, I remember how old I was, I must have been like 12 or 15. And I had a, um, I, I was at a record store, I was at a Newberry Comics flipping through Misfits Records and Sam Hain Records. And a uh, punk guy that was also doing the same thing asked if I was going to a show. And I said, I don't know what, what you're talking, I don't know what you're talking about. And he showed me a flyer. And later, later on that day, I showed it to my father and asked to take me there and because he lives in the city. And, you know, he, he pulled up, side, brought me off. I went in. I pretty much pressed myself up against the wall. I was just completely overwhelmed sensory-wise. Um, I don't even think I saw a band. I don't even think I could see the stage from where I was. I was probably two feet away. Um, but I was hooked at that point. You know, um, it was just adrenaline of it, the 
um, the excitement, the, just the overall electricity in the room, I could feel. And I felt that it was just so powerful. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. And I, I, when I went to a hardcore show, I had no idea what the culture was. And I'm like, how are these people even acting this way? I'm like blown away. Like, yeah, it was just like the, the overpowering personalities. Everybody seemed to shine. And so I felt like I was, you know, three years old and a room full of 50 year olds, you know. So it was it was just really overwhelming, um, but also really at the same time. And not far from that, I started uh, going to shows with um, Jeff, our old bass player uh, from Converge. We used to go into this constantly and go to, you know, shows all around New England. Uh, and then uh, we met Kurt. Of Converge, and we started dra- driving the show together and whatnot, and then traveling all throughout the world to, to see bands that we. Yeah, it's really to me that's always kind of interesting how those you know kind of first formative experiences really kind of inform uh, just so much, and you you can like almost go back to that that moment and like remember photographic that room and, and what it was. Do you know remember who was playing? Um, I was told later that it was always an idea to shoot a show. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that's kind of what, like, and I tried to do some some forensics on that to see if that's actually, I think it, it's probably, actually, probably what it was. Wow. All right. That's, that's, that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty good one <laughs> uh, to, to start off with. When, um, when did you start realizing that you wanted to participate and, and try and make your own music? I mean, I was already trying to make music by then. You know, that was always happening. I was told um, my my brother is a drummer and played a lot of like uh, like classic rock, heavy metal stuff. And he actually used to play covers in my basement uh, with this guy Terry, who Terry was starting a band called Disrupt. I don't know if you're familiar with Disrupt. Disrupt, yeah, great band. But so Dis- he just started Disrupt at the time. And all of those guys started giving me, um, giving me records, giving me dub cassettes of like all early ear stuff. And so they were really, they were really important in being a, a gateway for me, you know. And by then, I was already, you know, hacking away at songs on my bass in my bedroom, trying to learn stuff, trying to figure out ways of just expressing myself. And, you know, I couldn't have been much older than like 12, 11 or 12 at that point doing that. And I would sneak down and try to play drums and whatnot, um, you know, here and there as well. And just, yeah, sure. I, was always trying. I was always trying. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's kind of interesting because I think for certain people, it kind of, it, it's not always immediately apparent that they should do it. And then it just kind of happens. You know, like I was talking to Chase from Gate Creeper and his story is sort of similar to yours because skateboarding played a huge part in, yeah. uh, in, being that gateway and making friends and then friends who played music and for myself too uh i heard iron maiden because of the welcome to hell video and yeah, it that, that was it so it's just really these cultures that really bind you so when did uh converge start forming and coming to mind what how, how did that kind of come together yeah, you know it was just it was just an idea of playing music um playing heavy music we were trying to emulate the bands that were around us at the time which were like the slap shots of the world, the hardcore bands that existed. Um, and then at the time, there, there was a big melodic movement that was occurring. In and we were fans of you. And we were just like little kids uh, trying to do something, trying to find our voice. Um, I, I think Kurt joined Converge um, maybe a year into it or so because we needed somebody to be able to play a guitar solo and be more technical than us could ever be. Um, I was initially the bass player in the band. He had no singer. Um, I gave my bass to uh, my pal Jeff, who was playing guitar at the time. So he became the first bass player of the band. Mm. A lot of early photos. He gave a Rickenbacker that he always played. That was my Rickenbacker. Um, and uh, yeah, that, probably, we were all kids. We were all in high school, probably like so, freshmen and, and sophomores in high school at the time. Um, but we even started messing around. I was playing music with Jeff at even middle school in junior high. So we wow. were, yeah, we were trying to go early. Yeah, you're a grinder, man. I feel like that's sort of your approach. You've always just been, this is what I do, and, yeah. and it's going to work, and which I have 
always appreciate it. I found it. I found it to be a, a a voice that worked well for me. I found it to be something that was a good vehicle for for me, and I've never let go of it. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, so as you were um, just kind of figuring that out and Converse started happening, what was it like playing your earliest uh, like kind of shows and stuff like that, and just finding yourself as a as a performer? Oh, I mean, I don't think anyone really find myself a performer. Um, I just started playing and just trying to give everything I had to the songs that we were writing. You yeah. Know? Um, that turned into being something that was, you know, hyper aggressive and, and physical. And um, it just just happens that way. Um, sure. Wasn't really by design or anything like that. You know, I think we just knew, we knew what we wanted bands and we wanted to you know we with the, the passion that we'd like to see and we give that ourselves to and so it just kind of naturally started happening where our shows were you know progressive and positive at the same time sure sure of course um i i kind of always think of converge as you know i mean i i think a lot of people myself included uh, you guys uh, kind of have a sound that is so your own. You're kind of a lone wolf, uh, but kind of made up of these bits of all these different sorts of music. And I read a quote uh, just the other day uh, that you were like, we were not punk enough for the punk kids, not hardcore enough for the hardcore kids, not quite metal enough, but you kind of created your own tribe. What do you kind of attribute that to, that kind of like will to be on your own? Well, you know, it's it's just we're just aware of what we are you know there isn't really any posturing like we're not trying to play like a specific punk or hardcore or, or metal role you know, where we're the mass of the four you know we're a weird amalgamation and we accept that you know um so therefore we're not a puzzle piece that fits in anywhere um completely you know and we're okay with that we're, we've always been okay with being uh individuals and being a doing kind of whatever we want. Um, you know, because we didn't start playing music to be accepted by anything. You know, we play music to just, you know, express ourselves. And, and that's that's it. You know, like our, we've seen so many things come and go. We've seen so many trends and and styles and focuses uh, by artists. And we just continue to remain true to our basic belief system because it's the best compass that we could ever have. Sure. And I mean, I guess since you've been doing it for so long and from such a young age, it's just kind of there, there, there was no time to really make plans, right? It's just been there. Oh, I mean, you know, there was at some point that you, you try to make plans or you fantasize of how something is going to play out. But like, still, I'm the same person that started this band as a, as a little kid. I feel the same, you know. I don't know if that's a little bit of Peter Pan syndrome that occurs with a lot of people that start bands when they're young. Um, but it's it's accurate and it's you know it's still with me, and so like I'm I don't I don't feel any different. The older I have more responsibilities, sure you know, but like the drive is still the same. It's ultimately the same thing. Yeah, I've always, I've always found that to be uh, something at least for myself. It's always been so inspirational about converge in general, and then yourself as as you know, uh, kind of having everything kind of emanating from one same creative source, whether it's Death Wish as a business, Converge as, as your, your band, and then, you know, Umbra Vitae and Wear Your Wounds, and, and then obviously your, your amazing key design abilities too. It all just kind of feels like one part of one machine, one wheel. How do you kind of balance doing all that stuff? It's, it's just, it's, it's all one and the same, you know? It's just all coming from the same place. They're all related. They're all, you know, I'll be different kind of um, uh, creative characters and they all have different kind of goals depending on what they are. They're all coming from the same true place. You know, there's no posturing. And I think that you feel that within all of the, the, the projects that I'm involved in. Yeah, no, for sure. So um, can you kind of just talk a little bit about the, um, the kind of the moments earlier on? Because I feel like Converge has had a couple of different moments where in heavy music, you guys have had kind of a zeitgeist of, of a di different things, like m more than like 
a couple of times. And I feel like that's kind of a difficult thing to achieve. When was the first time do you, that you feel like Converge was like, oh man, something was really starting to coalesce around this band? That's a good question. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know. I guess people just started slowly paying attention to what we were doing. It went from there being nobody caring and then all of a sudden a few people started to care and there was a little bit of a sort of, you know, like reverberance of noise that was occurring. You know, people were starting to actually, that weren't just our friends. Um, you know, and, and then I don't, we didn't really look at it that much though. We still don't, like we still don't look in size or anything. We just go and do our thing. Yeah. And I think that that sort of like blissful ignorance that we have towards a lot of that keeps it, keeps it, um, it, it's a keep keeping us focused on the things that are most important and being creative. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, to me, I, when I, I think about Converge, it's, it's been a, a couple of different bands in a way, you know, like I listened to Petitioning the Empty Sky. I think that Petitioning the Empty Sky was when I first got into it. Sure. And uh, I was just like, wow, this is great. This is like this amazing well, metal chord. You know, and I'm always careful with with these kinds of questions because everybody has different entry points into music right so like there could be somebody that got into heavy music a year ago and their experience is just as valid as the you know the the, the man or woman that, that connected with their music uh in 1985 you know um i'm just grateful personally taken the time to grow with us there for us, whether they've been a whether they've been a fan or a supporter or whatever, how you want to define it, for six months, years. You sure. know? I just appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I just to me it's just kind of amazing to see that kind of sonic progression for over like this long period of time. Um what's a lot in this music world that have been around forever but they've just been in a whole lot of different bands right so like i mean saint virus is a great example right like okay are i, I doubt that Artie remembers me at, you know at like mind over matter shows in, in in boston and bad trip shows and stuff like that but i was right there with all you know like you know supporting those bands like and you see all these people you know, still stay involved in music and supporting the arts in some way whether they be you know playing and expressing themselves or just running venues or working with bands or promoting bands um we've just done it all within our own universe for a very long time and i, I think that's the that's the thing that's unique to us whereas there's still a lot of you know old players that are still relevant that are out there now yeah for sure absolutely i think um one of the things too is the progression of of the members and how that's also kind of gone with it. When is it? You know, obviously Nate was in Jesuit, an incredible band for anyone watching who hasn't listened to Jesuit. Listen to them; they're great. When did kind of Nate start joining up, and and what was that sort of like? He he joined up very early. Like you know, I always joke about it in the Converge universe, but it kind of is. In the sense that we were kids, I think it was like 1995, we met Nate, where his first band, Channel, were touring with us. And so he was touring with us on some of our first tours that we did in, in, you know, back then. I think I met Nate in 1994, something like that. Um, and then Jesuit with us the following summer. Uh -huh. and, and then we started needing somebody to fill in, and he started hanging out with us and sleeping on my couch in my apartment and and filling that role you know, and then ultimately decided to join the band as as jesuit was dissolving um you know so it's like he in some ways to me he's always been there he's he's always been there um at least during during the periods that we've been most active and you know working the hardest and putting in you know the the, the true time and, and efforts in all those you know boring years and whatnot so like to me, he's always been in the band. It feels like. And definitely just part of your world, right? It's like of like minds and, and stuff like that. That simple, right? You're like, hey, uh, how about my friend over here? He rules. Let's just grab 
this person. Um, and then obviously, I guess, you know, to get it to the kind of the converge that it is today, I, I think that, you know, I mean, it's, it's Ben Collar. I mean, Ben yep. definitely, I feel like that was, I feel like the agoraphobic nosebleed seven inch. And I know that Ben wasn't on that, right? That was another drummer. Yeah, that was John Giorgio. John, John's an incredible drummer too. John was in a band called Opera. He was a ripper. Um, he Guys, drummed- for about six months, he did one European tour with us, our first European tour, and it pretty much broke him. It was a hard tour, and it was really hard on everybody, and he just didn't want to play music after that anymore. He was all set, at least in, at the level of touring that we were doing at the time. Um, and then Ben joined pretty much right then, and he's been, and I, and I look at it as the same with Ben, too. Ben's, to me, has always been there. You know, it feels like that. Um, he joined in 1999, I believe it was 99, um, like early 99, and uh, just sort of interjected uh, an energy and enthusiasm into what we were already doing that helped us just be the band that we wanted to be. Yeah, I mean, Jane Doe happened right afterwards, and then a new kind of era, I think, coalesced around that, you know, Ben's participation in that sound. And in fact, today, um, I was sent something by Caroline, who works at St. Vitus, when I said, we're putting together a YouTube playlist of, of uh, you know, the guests who've been on the show, of all the same mm-hmm. And uh, there was this moment where uh, Ben, I think, broke a hi-hat clutch at playing at Vitus, and you just went, look, Ben's same for drums. And it was almost like true, because <laughs> he was just destroying so hard. And yeah, yeah. Like, wow who is this kid? I still remember the first time seeing him play. Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing him, like, rip the first time. He he, he was in a band called Force Fed Glass that were, like, a, a sort of a spazzy, metallic, hardcore band of the time. That's the first place I saw him play. Um, and I believe they, were, they, when they played for us, a few times, played opening for us a few times, and I saw him in that band. But then he started a project called Blue Green Heart with Kurt. It was more of, like, an indie rock uh, sort of vibe i guess and they rec- they actually recorded and released one seven inch and um and that was the band that he was going to be in with kurt it was going to be that project and then he chose then we needed somebody and said hey do you want to play with us and he said sure let's do it and i think he learned like eight songs in the night and we did it wow so it was just that simple huh yeah pretty much yeah, that's pretty pretty amazing. Um, when you're when you guys are you know kind of uh, writing songs and stuff like that, is now the kind of converge that we all sort of know this sort of lineup that's been together for a while and, and kind of consistent. How does writing kind of kind of develop for you guys? It depends on the the, the song. Um, more often than not, somebody has a a riff idea or maybe even Bird or Nate might have a semi-formulated you know, structure of a song. And then we would get into a room and slowly start getting at it and trying to shape it into the song that it ends up becoming. Sometimes it's a really simple process and sometimes it takes months and years. You know, just if, if something just isn't right, it's not right. We just don't, you know, we just don't move forward with it um so it's always different you know like we've been trying to stay productive in this time you know in this quarantine that we're all living in and that's posing some logistical challenges um but you know we're all trying to figure out how to to write and work together and um and just like in share ideas together you know in a different way so it's always changing it's always evolving so sure. But like we're we're kind of like an open, there's like an open door policy to riff. Like Ben might have a drum riff idea, and if he wants to bring that to the table and says, "Hey, I want to play something that's kind of like this," we if, we might be get all be inspired by that and say, "Yeah, let's do this and let's do that," you know, six times and then do that, and first we play something like this. Um, it, it's something that happens um, every once in a while. Riff that that works for this band. Well, for, for um, though I'm not a technical player like those guys, so it goes through a completely, completely different, you know, like uh, transformation once it gets into a convert song. Sure, sure. So it's just kind of being in the room and, and workshopping these ideas as yeah. a collective. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's that's pretty intense. Just like, you know, nowadays there's so many people who write on so many different ways with the computer and stuff like that. It's it's kind of nice to know that, you know, people work things out in real time like that. But now you guys are kind of right. Try, yeah, I mean, logistically it's hard. It is hard and, you know, and it, it gets harder as life, you know, progresses, right? Like, uh we don't all have we don't have all the free time in the world to just like hang out and play so we're definitely more technology dependent than we used to be um and we still will always favor being in a room you know over any sort of technical file one of the things that i find really inspiring but also sort of just, just kind of blown away by converge is how much the entire band is self-sufficient right you're making the art, Kurt's making the records, you guys are writing the music, you're, you're putting all so much together on your own. Um, has that ever, that process ever felt like overwhelming to you? Like, oh man, maybe we should reach out and get some help sometimes, or is it like, I can't let anyone kind of, I, I need to do this. We, we do work with other people, you know? And so like, we do, like I always, I, I do collaborate with other with outside illustrators and artists all the time. You know, but it's always under sort of like my basic art direction or something like that. Um, because you should, you know, you should be like have a hand in it, it's your vision, right? Sure. Uh, and we've had other engineers work on our record, but like over time, like we've kind of figured out that like if it, if we want something in the way we, and it's kind of up to us to make it happen, you know. Um, even if we didn't have the skill set to do it, we had to figure it out. So we would just do it. And that's why we have the worlds that we have in terms of, you know, me having a label and doing art for our band and other bands and, you know, Kurt recording and engineering for other bands and whatnot. Um, it kind of is what it is. Nobody was initially going to help us, so you had to figure out your own way. You know, a lot of people... But like site like the Jane record, for example, like uh, when they talk about Converge, oddly enough, I actually the initial design of my record, I hired I hired another illustrator to do that whole record, and I got the whole record, and I just didn't like it, and so I started over, did it, did it myself. Oh wow! I've done that in the first place, but I just felt that I don't know that I wanted to collaborate, you know, mm -hmm. collaborate. Uh, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but, you know, we're always open to that sort of thing, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's just kind of an interesting thing when, you know, I think sometimes you have to weigh, you know, what the priorities are in the band, the creative energy of the band is, how much you, you kind of can give at different times and in different ways. Well, you, know? It's time, you know, it's like, the, and there's, those, there's economics, you know, attached to it, you know? It's like, we don't, we don't, Less budgets, you know, more often than not, we have little to no budget, and we have to figure out ways to do things that are going to be cost effective and, and just, and just good, you know, and so sometimes you just have to like figure out how to trim the fat on your own, you know? Totally. And that, that becomes like its own sort of creative construct that therefore can yield some some pretty amazing results, right? Like yeah, over time, for sure. You know, like because um, the way I was, you were talking about how all these worlds are related. It's or, or like the conver converged universe of things, or like you know whatever creative output I have. I'm always sharpening tools, right? So like, if I'm working on deathless related things. I'm I'm still working on the same. I'm using the same creative mind and sharpening that tool for the next project. That could be a Converge project, or an Umber project, or Warrior Wounds project, or me work with another band. I'm always progressing, evolving, and you. I look at everything as part of a, a a constant creative process. Yeah. So, like this artistic collect, just feeding one thing into another, and yeah. honestly. That's something that, for me, you know, doing Vitus and obviously that being, you know, my baby and stuff like that and, and playing music and trying to do all these other creative pursuits, seeing kind of you as an example and, and how you've done these different things has always been kind of an inspiration to let everything kind of come from the same wellspring and, and try and continue that, that forward. And obviously, other DIY-minded artists like Fugazi, et cetera, et cetera, that really sure. kind of lit yeah, like we didn't invent it. We just took, we, we took the idea 
um, which is just your basic do it yourself idea. You just continue grinding with it, you know. Um, and that's just like that's just the best way to do. It. Yeah, for sure. So, question for you is: uh, When did Death Wish kind of come into the picture for yourself, and and what was what was the impetus to just start that label? Sure. Well, I started. I actually started putting out records in nineteen ninety. Uh, three, uh, two, 1992. I was a kid. I basically put out our first Converge Seven, which was from Friends. Um, I I sent it. I, I I pressed it. I paid for it. You know, I got the covers made. I was a teenager doing that. And then I um also put out the Converge LP, the Hitback LP. Uh, I did that with a ring with another friend because we often. We partner and do like split label things to kind of make things financially work. So I was already putting out records. I was already designing records for other other bands and other labels. Um, and as I, as that kind of world progressed, the design world. As I as I finished art school and started doing more design work for labels, I was taking records from the ideas all the way into manufacturing and delivery stage all the time there was a lot of labels that weren't even involved really once i once i started art and until it was delivered i was like well if i'm already doing all of this and getting paid 300 bucks a record to do this you know for like two or three weeks work, i may put out create a world that could put out our own record uh and so i started you know thinking about yeah, for a while. And, uh, yeah, I think it was 1999 we started, we were driving home from a Converge practice, and we went out to dinner, and I brought up the idea of starting a, a label to Aaron Beck and to Trey McCarthy, who, who were with me. And Aaron already had a label going on. Um, and I think, I don't know if he was going to stop it at the time. I'm, I'm not too sure how he was handling that. Um, but I was like, yeah, I think I might give it a go and put something out. I'm like, I don't know what record it'll be. And, uh, you know, I kind of kept thinking about it. And at the time, Converge had a split release with a band called Hell Child from Japan that we were working on. And that re that label that was putting it out actually folded in the middle of the thing. And the record had no home. And so I paid for the rest of the record, and we released it as the first death was released. And this kept grinding from that point on. For sure, for sure. Uh, you were breaking up a little bit in the, in, in, in there, uh, Jake. Just yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I live in the middle of nowhere, so <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, it's all right. We're in the quarantine. we got to do the best that we can, kids. We're, yeah. we're, we don't, we don't so have where, a studio. Where did, where did you lose me? You Did you lose me in the... Um, Somewhere in the middle, there, but I think that what we really got was that the the first track that came out in '99 and yeah, it was '99, and it was a Converge Hell Child split that kind of the label yeah. that was releasing it fell apart, and it kind of fell into our hands. So I, you know, I paid for it, and then and we released it. We borrowed a bunch of money from a bunch of people, and took all my savings I had and started, you know, like trying to put out records. Damn, and so th and there you go. And now, I mean, I remember the first, I think, Death Wish release. I think it might have been the dedication. I think that might have been yeah, the like four, 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 five, something like that. Yeah, and I fucking love that record, man. It's a great <laughs> band. They, were, they, they should have been bigger than they were, you know. They, um, they were a really special band at the time. So good. I think so Wildly. Yeah, two brothers. Yeah, wildly. Fantastic in that band. Yeah, and uh, what did they go on to do? Sex Positions? Was that... They, sex Positions. Uh, sex Positions was uh, di two different guys. That band also had a number of lineups, but that record was really fantastic. Yeah, those guys were fucking talented as fuck, and that's when I really started uh, paying attention to Death Wish as just something really interesting. It's not like, oh, this is going to be something that, you know, is going to release some Converge records here and there, and like... Right. That that's kind of it, you know? Um, and so, yeah, absolutely amazing job with the label and so many, so many great releases by so many like amazing bands. Um, how do you kind of, you know, just,
come across new music. I feel like um, every time I talk to you and Nate, you guys are so up on every, every band from that, that I know. And, you know, just recently I saw you talking about Brooklyn's very own Kralis and like some of their deep side projects. Um, well, I'm, I'm a music you know yeah. that's honestly that's that's what it comes down to i'm a fan of music i you know like i can't listen to like super extreme stuff all the time but i'm always listening and i'm always paying attention you know and i i i find it to be that are interesting like really interesting at this point in my life and i've been listening to heavy music for a long time so i have a good compass for it um but yeah, like yeah, there's there's so much incredible stuff out there. You just have to take the time to dig if you have the ability to dig. So I just listen. I just look and listen. I have friends that just like somebody like me that'll be like, "Hey, check this record out." Then him records too. Same kind of deal. Yeah, definitely. I think that for me that it's it's often too like um, my friends, you know, people that I yeah. respect been in the game for a long time you know if Artie or Ron Grimaldi or Paul Delaney from Black Anvil like these these sort of luminaries that have shown me so many different things you know if they tell me a record tie I'm fucking listening to that shit I'm like okay yeah, so much incredible stuff out there you know I always find that the year end list to also be fascinating too that started to come out from certain writers and blogs because there's always something you miss and there's always, always. Go back and I just kind of like, like I I forgot I, I forgot about that last Spirit of Drift record until I saw the the best of list coming out and I was like, mm -hmm. of course this record's incredible, you know um, yeah, you know, like and it's and it's not that things aren't don't connect with you right away. There's just so much stuff, so I just try to take the time and try to find stuff when I can. Um, right now it's it's kind of tough. I don't listen to too much music when I'm making music. So I'm in the middle of a lot of music right now and I have been since um, pretty much since like the, the end of last year. So I haven't been listening to that much. So I'm sure I'm going to have a lot of catch up coming up. Sure. So when you're not really listening to music, what's, or, you know, you're, you're kind of like weaning yourself off so you can kind of, I guess, you know, listen to yourself, which is a great they all is listening to things I'm involved in because you, all that stuff. The Umbra record was a, was a huge undertaking for us, so I was immersed in that for like three months. I had another record that I was working on uh, around that same time that I only listened to that up through the holiday time, and now I'm working on some other stuff now that now now that I'm now and now I'm into that project. So I, I do that because I keep my palette pure and I kind of I like to keep my focus on what I'm working on and I don't like it to get influenced by too many outside things while I'm being creative I like it to be my voice and confident that it's my voice yeah no that's I think that's a great thing and, and, and finding that and being kind of more internal to find that I think I mean, uh, I mean, it's boring you know you get bored if you, you, you want to listen to something like but sometimes, like, I took, like, I think I took, like, a half hour today and listened to, like, a Control Denied record. Because I was thinking about, like, I was thinking about, you know, Death, Sign of Perseverance, and it's like, still one of my favorite records all the time. And I never gave Control Denied enough, enough uh, time. And so, like, I was like, I'm going to give that a, a little bit of a spin because I have other things. It's not going to distract from what I'm working on right now. So I just kind of did that for a bit. But it's few and far between for me. Sure, sure. So let's talk about, you know, obviously Converge is a beast. It's, it's been the kind of the omnipresent thing in your life for, mm -hmm. for as long as you know, your musical life. But uh, I painted a bathroom today and listened to that Umbra Vite record because much like uh, what you just said, I heard a couple of songs. I thought it was great. And then I just sat there and I was with the roller just listening these riffs <laughs> pull me back and forth and i was like wow i can really understand why you say that's your your metal record how did that one kind of come down and uh if, if anybody hasn't heard it that came out this year uh believe it or not things happen so we, this year, and it's really yeah, good we made the decision to release the record um in the middle of all this chaos um rather than delaying releasing it um because why not um we decided to go you know, digital at first because all the 
we just let the release just kind of pass this and kind of drop it on the world. It came out of um, rehearsals. Basically, we had the idea of doing a heavy band and doing something that was like much more extreme than your wounds, but with, with the, the same core members. And uh, that's pretty much what it is. Also, uh, over a decade ago, I started talking to Sean Mark about doing something super heavy right after he quit Hatebreed. And in some ways, this is kind of also could be that considered that band as well. Um, you know, playing with guys like, like Mike Kenzie is such an incredible like songwriter and crafter and, and performer. It's just inspiring to be in a band with him um, and, you know, being, being able to play with coolest in the world. Greg is one of my favorite bass players in like the world of heavy music. He's so, he's so talented. And being in a band with, with John Rice is like a monster drummer. Yeah. So it, yeah, I couldn't ask for a better, better group of people doing this. And we just wanted to make a pure, a, a pure record that was death metal rooted. We knew it would sound like us, but be death metal rooted, and have a different message than stuff that was out there, and have a different kind of aesthetic. I think we had a different spin on things that was relevant that could be out there, and we just wanted to write clear, concise, fast, simple songs that just kind of had no. Relevance. And that's why the record like twenty six minutes. Or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I sat there and I was ready to kind of uh, strap in for longer, and then I was just like, "Man, this thing just first round KO!" Like it is. It's just it's, it it does let up, and that's all by design. Yeah, and it's 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 really fantastic. So congratulations on that, and that just came out. So everybody, you know, watching, go. It's on right now. Yeah, it's all digital stuff. And we're we're working on uh, physically. So we hope to have vinyl available really soon. Uh, we've been working on that for a while. We've had test presses for a while. So it's going to happen soon. Um, you know, we're just waiting for the right. Yeah, for sure. Obviously, with with everything kind of like that. I wanted to talk to th about some stuff. Obviously, you know, um, me and you have spoken a bunch before about, you know, just kind of other things in life that kind of inspire us. When you're not sharpening, you know, your creative tools and stuff, what what other stuff do you like to get into? I know you practice martial arts, other things to kind of keep your discipline. Have, like we've talked about it before, like I, like I have two kids, so I, don't, so so my life revolves around them, you know. Um, but like for a distraction that isn't music or art, the only thing I follow is combat. That's the only other thing I follow, and, you know. And I for a long time, and you know, the more I practice, and um, I I think I'm still a licensed. A judge in the state. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm rooted in that world. Yeah, for sure. I remember when you guys, that's what she used to sponsor Joe Lau's on and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah we sponsored Joe and Danny. Uh, we sponsored uh, uh, Tateki, who was also a Sia Don Cop. Um, he was one of the lot of the last before the rock came in uh, to you know be allowed to you know have guys walk out and have sponsor sponsored Dan a long time ago um, and when he first started uh, Toby Tigerheart Greer, a bunch of like guys that were fighting in like the LA kind of circuit um, yeah, there's a, a whole bunch of people. That's amazing and obviously, you know after, you know, playing Converger so many years and doing extreme music, shows are really physical how have you kind of like dealt with that, just continuing on and, you know, um, my body disaster, you know. Uh, I've had I've had a, a multiple knee surgery. I mean, after t in, after our touring in 2012, I actually um, we didn't really play for about a year. Um, we we were writing and stuff, but we didn't really have that much going on. Um, and I took that downtime and to get surgery on on one of my knees that was all messed up from playing shows. And so I they actually took my meniscus out. So I don't have one on one of my knees. One knee has two screws in it that hold it together. Uh, and the other one, I, I have no meniscus. So um, so that's made a lot of, like, um, like impact stuff hard on. You know, so running is terrible. It's, like, it's excruciating for me. 
Yeah, man, that's crazy. I didn't know. I didn't know that, um, and and how deep that was. But that's the life, kids. You say you want to yeah. be in a band like this for a long time. Yeah, it just it wrecks your body. But you know, you just try to like you know try to sleep a lot and try to you know take take as good care of yourself as you can. You know, and um, all you can do. No one's yeah. Pretty, we all try. We all try it for sure. Uh, Besides, uh, you know, doing that stuff, obviously taking care of your kids and, and you know, all, all of that stuff. When do you, uh, do you, I mean, you kind of put out a lot of design stuff, a lot of prints, things like that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that kind of side of your life and, and sure. just kind of. Well, it's all, it's all related. It's all one and the same I, to a degree. Um, you know, I've been, I've been involved in, in the print world for you know, a number of years um, and just making fine art, you know, and it's people um, at what I consider punk price for a lot of stuff. I've done a lot of silk screen stuff and she stuff. And I um, do a lot of promoting of other art at the Death store. Uh, so we, we do a lot of uh, fulfillment of stores for like people like uh, Thomas Hooper, um, Mike Shea, uh, Nick Pyle, um, we're launching the Mark Nava store this week. Um, there's some really hitters in the illustration, the illustration and world of things. Um, and it's all, it's all related to music in some way. And these are all people that are friends. And I'm just you know, honored to be able to be there as one of them, as a peer, and also promote them all as well. Yeah, so you just kind of just kind of feeding into that that same thing. I remember, I think the first time I saw any Thomas Cooper stuff was uh, was it Hope Conspiracy? I believe he did that uh, a Hope Conspiracy record, right? Was that the first time you guys worked together on something? No, t uh, Thomas. I've known Thomas for years. He, he was in a, a band in uh, UK that did a lot of shows with us. He actually used to tattoo us when he was an apprentice out there, when he was going to school, when he lived in London. And um, we, he did some Converge work. He did some Doom Riders work. Um, and then he later did... I, I had to do a tour poster for, for Converge in 2000... I want to say it was six, maybe? Five or six? Um, and yeah, and we've just worked together. You know, it feels like we've always worked together. But it's probably been about a good, good decade or so. For sure. That's, that's, a, yeah, I mean, that's an amazing connection. And for me, you know, uh, I feel like Death Wish and Converge has brought me into a lot of different artists' worlds. And, I, and I've learned from about a lot of different people just based on the aesthetics of the, the label and the band, you know? So yep. it's, it's a, a really cool thing to give less listeners. I think that you guys are always pushing that, um, like, way early on and, and really kind of lending a, a, a really kind of common aesthetic cell across every medium of, of the band uh, mm -hmm. before it's so easily done, I think, as well, uh, for sure. So we got about another 10 minutes left. Uh, I want to open up some questions, too, to anybody who's watching. If you use a little question box here at the bottom, you can ask Jake, uh, you know, a question. I, I, saw a few, I saw a few. Let's see. Yeah, so let, me, uh, let me look in the little box and see what's up. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, this is a good one right here. How do you balance energetic creative impulses with the patience needed to bring work to fruition from Jack Zima? Um, you know, I just, if I have an idea, I try to execute it or at least try to, um, I, I try to document it in some way so I know that I'm going to be able to recall it soon when I do have the time, you know? So like I might be in, it might be two in the morning and I have an idea and I wake up and I jot it down on my phone, you know, or, um, you know, I'm in the middle of something else. If I'm driving and I have a song idea, I, you know, I, I'll pull over and write it down or something like that. Um, you know, inspiration comes at a strange time. So I think it's just important to be aware of that and be open to when, when it happens. Sorry, Jake, we missed the last little bit of that. Okay. I just think that you just need to be flexible and open to um, 
open to how inspiration hits you. You know, you just have to flow, go, go, go with it. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And, and do you ever feel like there's a good time to cut bait with certain ideas? Like you're just kind of like, eh, or do you just, do you really try and pursue it? Depends. It really depends. Some, sometimes I just let go of something and come back to it later. Other times I push through it. It really depends on if there's deadlines and things like that involved, you know. That's really what dictates a lot of it. Here's one. Will Deathwish ever release the cursed box set? We want to. Um, we were waiting on art from Baisley, so I'll have to talk to Baisley about that. Again, I, he's been very busy. Um, his life gets crazy. Um, I haven't really touched base with them in the last like month or two, so I, I need to just just uh, check in with them anyway. So I'll ask if he has any time. We'll see. Yeah, for sure. All right, here's a, here's a Have you ever considered working in any other mediums? I mean, I just kind of work in whatever that I have. You know, I'm not that. Um, I'm not that picky. I consider what I do is just like, as like, like a big a big version, a big fine art version of rock um, cut and paste collage work. That's all, you know? Um, I just try to take it to a fine art level. Um, so I, there's, there's no rules in the way I, if I find something that, that I happen to like, I just roll with it and just use it. Um, so I'd use anything, sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, Here's one coming from the regular comment section. Will you have any books or podcasts that you would recommend? Uh, right now, I am, I've been listening to the uh, Chaos um, audiobook that a, um, that's basically about the CIA involvement with, uh, with uh, the Manson family in the 60s. And uh, if, if anybody is um, interested in U.S. history and especially that era of things, um, I, I definitely recommend that, that book. In nice. And let's see here. A couple more. Here's one. What are your favorite Boston hardcore bands from a co-host, Chris Enriquez, George? Oh, Chris, uh, probably Siege were, the, to me, the most important one. Most listened to would be probably Slapshot. Um, there's Classic. Certain, yeah, it's just, it just is what it is. I think everyone has a soft spot for, uh, for Rob Lund in Blood for Blood in that entire world. Um, I really respect those guys a lot. Um yeah, I mean, Boston is just such a melting pot of um, of music. You, you can't go wrong. You know, only living with people, some people that are a hardcore band, though they're more of a metal band, uh, but they were one of the most important uh, bands to me ever. For sure. I mean, I can't, I, I can't agree with Siege more. Uh, Siege is an incredible band, totally groundbreaking in, in my mind. So definitely one for sure, uh, that I would, I would recommend to everybody out there. Uh, oh, this one. Are you painting? Have you been painting at all lately? I did some work leading up to the age of quarantine, um, but I, I stopped because I haven't had any time. You know, like, yeah. this, one of the things that's happened in, um, due to, due to the, the pandemic is, you know, Death Wish had to slim down our office, so we have very little staff, and so it's only a couple of us that are packing orders and getting them out every day. That's all I've been doing. That's it. Yeah, I I orders. You know, like, um, and you know, I, I, I'll have time to be creative again at some point down the line. But you know, like, I gotta keep the life. Yeah, and I think that that's really important to for you know a lot of people. Obviously, is that you know at this point, uh, everyone, myself included, right? We're all just in the musical ecosystem, trying to find different ways to just at least keep the the, the lights on, keep, keep the, yeah the boat floating, right? Yep, and you know, and, and I'm I'm never above 
doing that anyway. I, I, I always, I'm the, I always, you know, I'm always I'm usually the guy packing the prints at Deathwish. Um, but it's just so busy. I, I just, we're just shorthanded and gonna make it all work. So we're all just doing the best we can. For sure, and putting out great records that people, you know, want as well. So that's, you know, the other part of the equation, which is which is great. So. Um, we got a couple minutes left. Uh, we usually end with just, you know, five records that you've been listening to in quarantine, but I don't know if you have five based on our, our recent conversation. Maybe you could tell, tell us about a couple of things that you're working on. Let's see. I can't tell you what I'm working on because... Oh, it's that secret. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, have, I have two... I have a couple things I've been working on. The Umbra record is out. That's done. There's a whole nother record of a whole nother band that nobody knows about that's also done. Mystery record. It's a mystery record, but I will tell you, it's a full length band, and I'm very proud of it. And I created a record with one of my favorite bass players of the heavy music genre. I'll, I'll say who it is, and you might be able to figure it out with some digging. It's with Shane Embry from Napalm Death. You heard it here first. And he's he plays guitar in this. Jesper, who is the bass player of Nazem. And a drummer named Dirk, who is in a small band that you have heard of called Megadeth. What? And we created an album together. And that's all I was. Wow. So, very so that, that's, a good, that's a good top four. We'll keep it top four. Jacob Bannon, Shane Embry, Dirk, who plays in Megadeth. Yes. And Jesper from, from NASM. Yes. Wonder what it could sound like. I fucking it's can't wait. Cool. That's, um, I that's also, yeah, yeah, and like, well, and we'll get to that. This quarantine messed up my plans with that record and creating art for that record. So, taking a little bit longer than I wanted it to, but it, it's gonna it'll, it'll surface this. Well, that's that's amazing, and that's really good news for all of us to hear that you, my friend, are keeping you know, the creative energy is still going so strong throughout all of this. And thank you for choosing to put out no the number. I, well. I should say one thing, and Converge is busy right now, too. Aha. Uh -huh. So we got some Converge in the back pocket as well. I can I cannot confirm or deny, but we're busy. Wow. Man, Jake Bannon is just here, just dude, fucking aces high, ready to go. That's something else. Well, we're both, we're all looking forward to it, Jake. And obviously, like, guys, listen to this Umbra Vitae record. It was fucking great. And, uh, you know, I, I listened to it for the first time today, and I was, you know, pretty floored by what I heard. And thanks so much for joining us, Jake. It's always a pleasure, always an inspiration. And, uh, you know, stay safe and well out there, right, man? All right. Thank you so much, man. Be good. All right. Bye, guys.